Um, my name is uh, John Haynes. Um, I've been involved professionally in pre-hospital um, care for over 40 years um, over a, a range of uh, portfolios, uh, starting off um, with the ambulance service as a, a MICA uh, paramedic and a MICA flight paramedic for many years. Um, I was, I've was been president of the First Aid Industry uh, Alliance, which is the peak first aid representative body. Um, Deputy Chairman of the New South Wales branch of the Australian Resuscitation Council for about four years. And um, I also formed um, Australia's first recognised private provider or commercial provider of um, first aid. Um, yeah, amongst them a number of other things, but yeah, I think that'll do. Closing this viable gap um, means that at the moment, um, despite the best efforts of dedicated professionals and volunteers over many, many years, um, we still are far too far away from um, uh, being able to give the community uh, good outcomes from our greatest cause of premature death, which is out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest. Um, it's yeah, there's been incremental changes, but it's, it, it causes us to lose around about 30,000 Australians each year, um, and they range from the young through to all ages. Um, so, you know, it's not just an old person's problem. Um, you know, we've been working on systems to make it uh, easier for people to close most of uh, these gaps that exist within the way that emergency response uh, works. But currently, you know, it's, it's the survival rates are, uh, for this are range from about four to maybe 8% for cardiac arrests that occur prior to the arrival of an ambulance. Or as I prefer to sadly term it, a resuscitation failure rate of 92 to 96%. So, Closing the survival gaps is, uh, means a lot. Okay, there's uh, four, some people are now saying five key links, but uh, essentially, if we looked at uh, the first link, uh, it relies on people firstly identifying the fact that someone has actually had a cardiac arrest. And that actually is not as easy as it may seem for some people, because when some people have a cardiac arrest, they'll actually start to fit um, they'll have a seizure and that's because suddenly the brain has a, a lack of oxygen and so they may um, mis misconstrue that as a, as a fit. Um, so we lose time. And then the next part of that link is, to, uh, is an early call to the emergency services. Studies have found that 20% uh, of people ring friends, relatives, neighbours, local doctor before ringing triple zero. We lose time. Then the other problem is when you do um, contact the ambulance service, well then obviously they, they want to know what your location is. We'll see you may be in a different suburb, a different city, a different country. Um, you may not know uh, the exact location, so again you lose time. The second link is uh, early CPR and um, the majority of people just don't know how to do CPR. Um, it's been really good in uh, recent years um, where the call takers uh, are giving instructions to the people at the scene uh, to do chest compressions. Um, but, you know, as to the efficiency of that, um, who knows? Um, and um, so there's a problem. Uh, then it relies on the next link being early defibrillation. And, uh, well, where is your defibrillator? Where is your local nearest defibrillator? See, people rely on public access defibrillators. Well, they may know where it is, but then there's the problems of actually getting there, retrieving it and coming back. And there's a whole lot of different aspects all around that. And so with 80% of cardiac arrests occurring in the home, you get poor outcomes because there's no defibrillator available. And then the average response time for ambulances usually exceeds 10 minutes. It's not their fault, it's just the way it is. And so what happens is for every minute you lose, 
without defibrillation, you lose 10% probability of survival. And you can extend that out a bit longer with your CPR, which is great, but ultimately the only thing that will revert a person into a normal rhythm, right, because it's an electrical problem, is with a defibrillator. And so you combine all of those things together and you end up with a train wreck, statistically, in most cases. I got um, heavily involved in trying to make things simple for people with my team. We've done that in a number of ways and I can explain that shortly. But um, the reason I've become so obsessed with this is because I was scarred. I was scarred by 16 years turning up mostly to lost causes when it came to out of hospital sudden cardiac arrests. And um, it does. It's, uh, you know, you don't get that many uh, resuscitations, successful resuscitations. We had some, we had some great ones, and it feels fantastic when it happens. But in the majority of cases, uh, they were lost causes because of those significant problems within the chain of survival: early call, early CPR, not having a defibrillator, and our response time that usually yeah, exceeded or came pretty close to 10 minutes. Um, it's been something that um, I've been trying, my, with the help of my team, trying to uh, make things easier for people to be able to save lives. And we've done that in a number of different ways. Um, uh, we provide simple solutions as much as we can to help people save lives. And we've done that in a variety of ways. And it doesn't matter where they are in the world with these things that we've, we've done. Um, we produced... Um, uh, the world's first smart first aid books. We have a number of um, first aid guides um, from very simple to more complicated and um, but we included QR technology into them so that when people scan them um, they can um, see a, a demonstration of how to manage um, common injuries and uh, acute medical conditions and things like that. Uh, and it, they cover all learning modalities. So you've got visual, audio, and written. And so it, it, it helps people, simplifies it, makes it so much easier for them to learn uh, basic management. We developed a, a First Aid Fast app. Um, the First Aid Fast app is very unique in that um, it will automatically adjust to wherever you are in the world in quite a number of ways. So, for example, um, the first key is, um, what is the emergency number? Well, it will automatically adjust to the number for the country that you are visiting. Um, what is your location? Well, it will give you your physical address um, and, or pretty damn close to it. And if it's uh, not a physical address in existence, like you're in a country road, it'll, it's, it'll still give you the GPS locations so that you can tell the ambulance service exactly where you are. It has a global hospital locator um, with turn-by-turn -turn, um, instructions on how to get there, directions. It ha covers the uh, videos, very simple videos on how to manage the most common uh, acute injuries, um, acute medical conditions and venomous bites and stings. And then it will also adjust to the venomous recommended uh, venomous bites and stings management for the continent that you're visiting. And that's just some of the things, and we've done that as a free, and that's now a free download, uh, First Aid Fast. Um, and um, e-learning, uh, we, in 2003, uh, we created probably the first uh, customised e-learning first aid training and assessment system. It took our competitors quite a few years to catch up, which was great. Um, and, uh, and, and Smart First Aid Kits, uh, with Smart First Aid Kits, you, you get kits in all shapes and sizes and different types of materials. Um, but the thing is, if you don't know how to use its content, like it, it's, 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 they are essentially a dumb object. So we put smart technology into those, which we're further in, uh, developing at the moment and will be available. So yeah, wherever you are in the world, we've really tried to make things very, very simple for people. Okay, well, we create uh, things, uh, information for people uh, in a very easy format where required um, so that it's easy to understand and we help them to reduce panic. 
No, because panic is something where I've seen people going around and around in circles like a headless chalk uh, because they haven't been able to cope. And so it really needs to assist them. Even if they've done a first aid course and if it's something, someone uh, dear to them, or no, and not so dear, whatever, they know them, they're not, they're not quite often will not cope. Um, so we need to add simplicity into it. Dot points, right? So I have um, first aid books that are comprehensive, nice and thick, but they're learner guides. They've been very popular, uh, but they're useless in an emergency. So we've created very, very simple instructions. Do this, dot point. This dot point, do that. Next dot point, do this. Very, very simple, so that they don't uh, panic and uh, they're able to be as effective as possible for the well-being of the person that they're helping. Um, the only thing that's really going to change it, because um, people are trying their best to find all these incremental little changes to, but we're, we're just touching at the, at the sides of things. It's never going to happen unless there's a technological change. So at the moment, um, the big thing is uh, public access defibrillators. And there's a lot of really good people out there who um, are encouraging the purchase of more public access defibrillators. But um, unfortunately, statistically, there's probably been millions sold around the world. Um, and statistically, there's been no really significant change at all. Um, and um, they find that uh, with public access defibrillators, um, uh, the use of them only ranges from about 2% to 5% uh, prior to the arrival of an ambulance. Uh, and then, you know, the, the other problem with public access defibrillators is, you know, where the heck are they in relation to your house? And there's a whole range of issues around actually retrieving a public access defibrillator, um, which uh, needs another question for that one alone. Um, and so, Technology needs to go from a public access uh, defibrillation perspective into a personal defibrillator perspective. One that is small, one that is light and portable, one that is affordable, one that um, people don't feel intimidated, really simple to use. Technology is the only way that it's going to change some the survival rate for out-of-hospital sudden cardiac arrest because the current one isn't working.